So I will open with our opening prayer, and then we will begin. So please pray with me. Dear gracious Father in heaven, we thank you again for this time that we come together. Be with us as we read and learn and get ideas on how we can put the Bible into play into our life so that we can help tell your story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are Mark chapter 3, um, and I used a different Bible this time, so now we're going to read that beginning part again in chapter 3. Um, but how would you travel to see or experience an event? Because this is kind of like in that part about the great crowd that follows Jesus. Depends on how much money I have. Ah, depends <laughs> on how much you have. So if there was if there was someone or something you really wanted to see, would you do make every effort to go? Yeah, if I had enough money, yeah. Okay. So money would be the hinger on it. Like even mm -hmm. Okay. How far would you go? Just as far as your money would take you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> So you wouldn't just kind of just keep going and try to make it there. It was just some cheesy event. Yeah, it's just, just a, a want, not a need. So. Okay. so how about this instance? How about you hear, like, put yourself in these, because this is like a weird time, right? Way back, they talk about these people traveling that great distance. If you heard Jesus, this would be a hard one. If you heard Jesus was in Jerusalem, what would you do? go <laughs> and then it wouldn't matter how much money right no i had to sell the house i'd sell the house sell the house. i mean because i was trying to think of that right how would how would we do that what would that look like if we heard that because these people heard that he was there and they kind of describe like where they were coming from all over you know um it would would you say he was in florida and you had no car and you had no transportation, would you do your best to walk there? I think I would try, because then if it was meant to be, maybe some kind person would, I would trust, maybe I would trust a kind person to take me. Okay. Along. Yeah, it really just kind of depends upon what it is. You know, I don't know, like, I don't know if there's you anything I would like really sacrifice everything to go see, except if I found out he was here, then maybe I would probably do that. You know. Would um, you guys walk? What's that? Would you guys walk? I would probably, I would probably get as far as I could, like with some other thing, or I would walk. If it was him, if, it, if Jesus was there. Are we talking us like today? Yeah, right now, if you heard. Okay, wouldn't there be TV coverage on every channel? Ah, and YouTube and Facebook. And all over the place, right. Right, right. And that and way you can avoid the crowd, the germs. Yeah and get a better view than you would if you actually were there. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. For me, I would probably want to, like, be there. Just I think be that, yeah, there would be something about feeling the spirit radiating from Jesus, you know, and wanting to be someone who touched his cloak, you know, the hem of his garment, it would be, you know, something, but I guess I can't, I just can't imagine that. Getting close enough? Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't imagine what that would be like, but yeah, I suppose, I don't know. Yeah, it would really be a little crazy or something to kind of do that. Um, yeah, it, it, 
But I mean, I have spent a lot of money to have some experience, some travel experiences mm -hmm. that I've wanted to do. So, um, and Jim and I have done that, put ourselves in debt. That took us a long while to get out of, but we wanted experiences. You know, we like to scuba dive, so we would go to the Caribbean every year for 14 years. And, you know, we had no kids, so we didn't have to worry about feeding our kids, you know, clothing our kids. It was like, if we have to eat stone soup, we'll eat stone soup, you know, but we're going to go diving. Because they have good food at the dive resorts, so we won't go hungry while we're down there. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I guess if, if the experience were something that I really wanted to have, yeah, I would do whatever I had to to have it. Yeah. And, like, it would be the difference. Like, if I heard, I would probably just leave. Right? I would, you know, would you leave? Would you prepare? Would you, like, how would that, I mean... I just try to put myself into that situation like right now. Right now it's different, right? I, like I'm preparing to go on a motorcycle ride. Um, so there's preparations before and that excitement and all that stuff because I know that's there. But like if I found out that Jesus was here, like all that would just be gone. I would just be, I think I would want to just be gone. Or would I be concerned about what's going to happen to me on the way? I don't think you'd think about that until, God forbid, something happened. Yeah, that could be. It's just an amazing thing to hear what those people did to go see Jesus. Yes. And I, and I just wonder where I would be if that opportunity arose for me. Um, and then there's always the, the correct answer, which would be just go. But then but how long is he going to be there? And will you have time to drive there, right yeah. there? Yeah, a whole lot of different things. Um, and it doesn't really say like a lot, but people sacrificed a lot probably to go see him. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes I put it into perspective or in a different perspective of right now, today, we have that opportunity, right? To go experience and worship Jesus. We have that right now, today, right? Yes. By just simply like participating in church. Um, and sometimes that's even a challenge where people won't come to do that. Yeah. And, you know, I know that I've fallen short in that, you know, as well. Like, I'm not going, you know, he'll be there long enough. I can go the next time. I can go the next time. Um, so just different, just different perspectives. Um, and then when you were there, it kind of talked about if you were there in that crowd, in that sea of people, where would you want to be? Would you push your way to the front? Joanne's yeah. shaking her head, yeah. I mean, slowly, that, slowly. Slowly, you would kind of like make yeah, just your way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I'd be apprehensive, but I'd want it. Why would you be apprehensive? I don't know. I do think that I would have some form of like fear of being scared. Yeah, in a mass of people. Well, no, just it's it would be so overwhelming. It's like, oh my gosh, if I made it to him, what would he say to me? Are you hurt <laughs> being right there? Yeah. So yeah, there would be that appre yeah, that's a good one of that apprehension as you're getting closer. Um and seeing it, you know. I'd probably be sweating, my heart would be pounding. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take the blood pressure then. Um, What's that, Kathy? Tongue tied, dry mouth, couldn't talk. <laughs> yeah. Make a fool of yourself. I always think negatively. <laughs> <laughs> uh. 
Um, and then is this where he like, I don't have my cheaters. So bear with me when I try to find this stuff. I left him in my other car. So all of a sudden I was looking for him like, darn it, I don't have them. Um, oh, you haven't learned. You have to have about 10 pair of cheaters and you have to have one in every room of the house. On every, you need to have one in every room that you go to. I, in, I do. In the I, sometimes I end up with like three pair in one spot. That's the only thing that annoys me. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, my husband ends up with, they're all in the, the bedroom after a while because that's the last thing he takes off, you know. Yeah. Yeah. He forgets to grab it to bring it downstairs. <laughs> Well, I'm learning. It's a slow process, but um, so there it is. You're finally there, right? You, you've reached your point. You're up in the front, and all of a sudden, Jesus does this thing that he has where he, like, does that whole demon thing, and so in question number four, I find it interesting that every time, this isn't, you know, Every time Jesus confronts demons, they say, they, they say, and this is interesting, they don't ask, they don't seem hesitant, but they say, you are the son of God. And then he tells them to leave that person, and subsequently they do. And then he says, don't tell anyone. I just find that interesting that for some reason, demons have no question who Jesus is, but the people do. Does that, does that, do you find that interesting? I mean, that's just, there's no question here. There's no nothing. Or why do you think they are so sure he is the son of God and that they just simply obey him. And these are demons. But people don't even believe who he is and don't even really obey him. I just the find demons that. Have free will. What's that? The demons have free will. Mm, probably. I think everybody does. I don't know. I think that's probably why people don't, you know, they choose not to believe where the demons know who he is. They know. And I don't think the demons really have free will. Their whole, uh, their whole reason for being is to fill the souls of human beings so that God can't enter so when he appears they know who he is because that's the job they're doing they're saying yep, yep. believe that's yep. their yep that's that's my story and i'm sticking to it all right <laughs> that's good i was wondering aren't demons fallen angels oh. i think wasn't um isn't the devil a fallen angel yes but i don't know about yeah, the, the king other. Devil, like the king dude is i don't know about all the other ones yeah. yeah probably you know i just find to me it's just a very interesting thing there's just no question they just he says come out and leave and that's what they do yeah no well, question. They know yeah well they know his power yeah and how about, the interest, the other interesting thing there, imagine the crowd. They're all around, and there's Jesus, and here's a demon-possessed dude, right? And all of a sudden, they say, and when they say it, other people must hear it. And they say amongst this whole crowd of people, you are the son of God. I mean, talk about a witness, <laughs> There it is, the demons are witnessing to this whole crowd who Jesus is. And then he says, get out, and they do. I just, to me, that's just like an amazing type of, and then I look at me and people during that time, how he was there and they just questioned who he was. 
But I liked your answer, Kat. That was a good one. So then we move on to the 12 apostles. So this is, um, my question was to see, like, who used Google to help this answer? Um, <laughs> that's the first thing I did, <laughs> um, was I, I Googled, you know, what is the difference between an apostle and the disciples? Because sometimes you hear the 12 disciples, right? And they're those same 12 guys. But now you hear, and even like in the beginning, Jesus called his first disciples. And then you read this a little bit further, the 12 apostles, and them same guys are in there. So what is the difference between apostle and disciple? Well, I did not Google. Oh, just because oh, you're too smart and you know the answer. <laughs> no, no. But I didn't even think to Google. Oh. <laughs> but I believe the difference is that all followers of Christ are disciples. But the apostles were given authority by Jesus to cast out demons and to preach. You know. Um, I think that's the big difference. And that's stated right in verse 14. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him. In other words, with him, traveling with him all the time. And he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So I think that's the difference between an apostle and a disciple. Okay. Anyone else? I think that's great. I was going to say one were appointed and then when she teaches them how to act, what to do, they become the disciples. Or do I have it backwards? They were disciples and became apostles? Well, when I Googled it, because that's what I did, uh, <laughs> I like Google, and, and literally I typed in, what is the difference between apostles and disciples? And their main thing, they one of the things they said was the same that Kathy said, that um, ev all apostles are disciples, but not all disciples are apostles. The apostles, in their definitions, was the apostles are the ones that were sent out to teach and preach while the disciples were there to like learn from the apostles. So in sense, those 12 were both apostles and disciples because they were with Jesus who was teaching them. And as Kathy said, giving them the authority to go out and teach and preach, right? So then they would become so they were the disciple of Jesus, but then Jesus said, okay, now you are my apostle who you're going to go out and teach and preach on my behalf. So interesting enough, at some point, you are, we're all disciples, but then there are also times where be ready because at some point you will probably become an apostle, right? You would be sent out to teach, you know, um, and teach about Jesus, right? I mean, nobody really now, like, casts out demons, per se, right. um, and stuff like that. But if we look at it as you're going, you are being sent. You're being sent to go, and that's what these guys were doing, right? After they learned, they were sent out to go and do. And for me, that's like the difference. If I'm a disciple, I'm coming here, I'm learning, and then the next thing, I'm going and doing. So, so, so would you say, in a sense, that missionaries... Uh, they're disciples, but they've also become apostles in the sense that they're going to an area of the world where there are many um, who don't know about Christ and 
missionaries are teaching them and uh, hopefully they'll be open to receiving the Christian faith. Yeah. So, but it's interesting you were saying something about nobody casts out demons anymore. You know, we don't think about demons in the United States, but in many countries in Africa and in India, uh, demon possession is still very prevalent. And I learned this from a, uh, a pastor in the North American Lutheran Church who uh, grew up in Ethiopia and several of the other um, pastors in, in the NALC went on a trip to India and they were baptizing. And he said, everyone who came to be, nearly everyone who came to be baptized was also demon possessed and they had to pray over them. And he said it was really um, quite an experience to see what would happen. I mean, the, the, the physical fighting going on in these people's bodies, I mean, physical bodies, you know, and then all of a sudden the demon would just go, I've had enough of your prayers, I'm getting out of God. <laughs> You know, yeah. so we just don't think about demon possession in the United States and in the so-called civilized developed world, but it's a very real thing. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, and I'm saying even like the apostles are even here. Like I'm saying at some point, everybody on this screen night right now mm -hmm. has the chance to be an apostle. At some point, you will be sent to go and teach about who Jesus is. At some point, it's probably going to happen. You might never know that it's happening. Um, but I believe, that's just me personally, I believe that that will happen. If we are truly a disciple, that sooner or later, we will, I think in the process of the end of Matthew, where it says go and make disciples that process is actually you becoming an apostle and teaching other people to follow jesus mm -hmm. okay. so i mean i like to make things simple because i'm like a real simple-minded person um so that's how i break those down yes that's me a simple-minded person um <laughs> no comment <laughs> that's okay um, so where is the scripture reference that names the 12 apostles? So that is in Mark chapter two, verse 16. He names all 12 there? Uh, yes. Oh, well, I, I haven't counted, but I think it is. So chapter he appointed two or chapter three? Chapter three, oh, sixteen sorry, through three. eighteen. I'm sorry. Yeah, chapter three. Chapter, chapter six chapter three, verse sixteen. Yeah. So through nineteen. One, yeah. So one of the things, you know, we didn't do this in the whole book of Luke. Um, and usually I try to do it early, but that term scripture reference, you know what that means, right? If I say what's the scripture reference, you know what to look for, right? Because sometimes one of the things we have to be careful of is using terminology that people might not know. So scripture reference in term is book, chapter, and verse. Um, so a lot of times when people say, well, what's the scripture reference for that? That's what it, it, it's not being able to memorize the actual verse itself, but just knowing where to look. Um, and that's one of the things that I think is important is kind of understanding some of that basic terminology. Um, so that's why I threw that in there is what is a scripture reference? So then we all kind of know what we're talking about. Um, so anytime that we say that, those are the three things that we should have. Book, chapter, and verse or verse ends. Um, so, yep, it kind of names them out there. It's interesting. I think the other thing that's kind of weird is um, 
in chapters one and two, he talks about calling some of them. But then all of a sudden, they're just all there. We don't even get the whole story about how the other guys, like, showed up. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always wondered to myself, why don't we know their backstory? Where did Thaddeus come from? Who was he? Right? Those are things that pop into my mind. <laughs> um, you know, we know the other ones because we hear their story. Um, mm -hmm. But we don't hear, it doesn't seem like we hear everybody's story. Um, doesn't say Andrew, Thomas, Thaddeus. Yep. And James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. I don't know. It's just like, I, those are just some of the weird things that I like pick out when I read these things. And I think we heard the, a few, but not all. But then all of a sudden, everybody's listed. Um. This one here, number seven, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but like when I first started and I worked with kids all the time, um, one of the questions or even older adults will ask, well, is like, is suicide forgivable? Is murder forgivable? You know, so they ask what sins, and then they say, well, what sins are not forgivable? Because there's, I think it's, there's a couple of the denominations that actually say there's like seven deadly sins, meaning they are not forgivable. But in the Bible, and this is a mm -hmm. good thing, is, is in the Bible, it indicates and it tells us what sin is is not forgivable. And Blasphemy. what's that? Uh, I was going to say blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Right. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, by the Bible, the only unforgivable sin. So the important thing of this is where I got that scripture reference is what is that scripture reference? Mark. Three, um, chapter Mark, chapter three, uh, twenty verse twenty nine. Okay, so like one of the, I I think those are like important things. So when people are asking us, and we are giving them biblical answers, we are saying, okay, well, let's turn to here. And let's see what the Bible actually tells us, you know, and it's very clear that that's what it says. Nowhere else does it say what other sins are not forgivable, that other sins aren't. Um, Why? What caused suicide to be embedded in my brain that it's an unforgivable sin? Like, you take your own life, going to hell. Well, Anybody else have that embedded in their brain? Yes. Yeah. I think from being around a lot of Catholics, yeah. because that's what they believe. I, I believe Catholics actually have seven sins that are not forgivable. I don't know mm -hmm. what they are. I don't care what they are, because <laughs> I know that there's only one. <laughs> um, and yeah, because I, this is, no, I, I was just going to say, in the, in the Catholic faith, you know, I think things may have changed over the years, but when I was growing up, if you committed suicide and you were Catholic, you could be, not be buried in consecrated ground. In other words, right. in the Catholic cemetery. Right. You know, because you had committed one of the most unforgivable sins. You had killed yourself. You had, you, it's like, you know, I know, I don't know the, I can't give the scripture reference, but I know in the Bible it says that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So I'll have to find out where that is. Um, so it's like you've blasphemed against God by destroying one of his temples. Maybe that's the reason they say it's unforgivable. But 
it's just a human being who's in intense pain. And the only way they see out is to leave this world because the pain is too great. They can't find, they can't see any other way. So they need to be looked upon with great compassion instead of with scorn. Right. It's really, yeah, it's hard, it's a hard, you know, and I, I, I'm also a believer that, you know, sin is sin. So it's, if you destroy the temple by like that horrible thought of suicide versus destroying God's temple through alcoholism or, you know, pretty much anything else, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I like it that it's, Again, I like things that are simple, um, and this tells me that the only thing that's unforgivable is me blaspheming the Holy Spirit, and that's calling him out, saying pretty much that he doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, and then if that's the case, that would make sense, because why would I ask for forgiveness if I don't believe in that? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I remember the first funeral I ever had to do was when I was working in the real world managing warehouses and stuff like that um, while going to school and being active here and people there knew what I was doing um, they at one of my co-workers husband hung himself and that was the first funeral that I did <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so it was you know to really be able to, pro at that time, then it's, it puts a whole different light on is suicide forgivable because your job during the funeral is to instill hope in those that are there through Christ. So how would you not do that as like a Christian person? Um, and then being able to just, you know, turn to it with all the other stuff that says, What's going to happen when you, when as a believer, you pass away? Um, and being able to say that to the surviving spouse and kids and stuff like that. Um, but you're not alone in that, Joanne, that thinking that that is one of them. And kids, like teenagers, that is like the main thing. Yeah. Is that because unfortunately, nowadays, they all experience it. Yeah. It's amazing. When I was in oh, high no. school, I never, there's nobody in high school that did that. All right. Now Over the 15 like, years that I've been at Children's, the number of mental health cases has just soared. Oh, yeah. We've, every day we'll have anywhere from 7 to 15, 20 kids waiting for placement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's amazing it's what, what's going on. Yeah. Um, and then we end with Jesus, Jesus's mother and brothers. So during that little situation, how at the end does Jesus view family? Everyone's family. Everyone, yeah. <laughs> Whoever's around you. And in particular, what I mean, everyone. Mm -hmm. Everyone has the potential to be family, because he says that whoever does the will of God is my mother and sister and brother. Yeah, and I so, mean, for me, yeah. I think that's a key thing, right? At the very end when he says, whoever does the will of God is family. Um, so if, if all of a sudden you're surrounded by a group of people who do not believe, and you do, are they your brothers and your sisters? No. Yes. <laughs> But they can become your brothers and sisters. Yes. By you giving an example and, and talking 
about your faith in God Yeah, I mean, it's like a, for me, that's like a thing, right? They are my, I would classify, if I was around everybody. My camera's froze up. Whose is? Yeah, Kathy. I think Kathy, did yours freeze up too, Joanne? He killed a brand. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we there go. go. There we go. Woohoo, we broke free. Um, Two of you are froze. Uh, don't pay the ransom. Don't pay the ransom. I got free. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> You know, for me, again, I take everything kind of what it is. And Jesus says, if you do the will of God, you are my brother and my sister. So more than likely, if you're not out doing the will of God, you're not really my brother and sister in Christ. I would consider you my neighbor. So if I go to that part where he says, love your neighbor, um, you know, love those who maybe aren't your brother and sister. So hopefully they would, as Kathy said, Kate said, I can't remember how we were supposed to call you two. Um, <laughs> Kathy over there, that Kathy. Um. <laughs> you know, maybe I should change my name here to Kate because that's where things get con got confusing <laughs> in my family too, because my brother married Kathy. So I became Kate and it's getting to be the point I need to <laughs> differentiate that even more. More and more. Yeah, because we don't want to make, we want to make sure we don't think your brother married you. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to be Kathy Bork Bork. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that, that, that's kind of the thing. And that's where we always say, welcome to our brothers and sisters in Christ. During baptism, we welcome the newly baptized into the... Family, family of Christ. Christ. I think Paul calls us adopted uh, children of God. Adopted. Yeah, I don't know. Um, that Kathy over there, um, she's experienced baptism firsthand, right? Yes. Your grandkids are adopted. Um, yes. So you understand adopted into the family. Um, My brother was adopted also. Okay, so you have a really good idea of this whole adoption process. Yes. Um, I understand it just from people who have experienced it or whatever, but nobody in my family has been adopted or has adopted, nothing like that. We're actually um, what we would consider family <laughs> through that process. But Jesus gives us a different perspective. So in our sense right here, we would all be brothers and sisters, right? Yes. Some would be older, right, than some of us others. So some of you guys are the older brothers and the older sisters, but nevertheless, we're still family. Or, or maybe I'm the black sheep of the family, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, but you're still part of the family. Right? I mean, even the black sheep is still part of the family. Um, so then we move to chapter four, um, which is a couple few parables. Um, in the parable of the sower, what challenges are there that hinder the growth of the seed? And then... What can you do when you see them in your life? Because that's our challenge, right? We can see the perfect world and we can say how wonderful we are. And of course, we're, you know, had seeds planted in good soil and we're the ones that are doing all that. But have you ever seen those other hindrances in your life? Well, the devil trying to do his work. Yeah, right. You were you told me that this morning. Yes. He was there this morning fighting me to make Bible study. <laughs> um so in an essence, if you were looking at that, since in here, um that hindrance could have been one of them other things where that seed was plucked away. Right? Right. 
there's kind of two ways to look at it. One is, you know, like here's talking from my perspective, be the good soil. But also, um, also I look at another point of view is look at from God's point of view. He's throwing the seed out everywhere. He, he yeah. wants everyone to come. So he's throwing it out to the people who might, might be, uh, the devil might switch, take them from him, but he, 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 he's, he's generous. He wants to throw the seed everywhere. And it is going to fall kind of like everywhere. If you're, if you're just kind of going, the seed's going to go. Um, and every time, like, I go out, um, a few of you follow me on Facebook. So a few of you see my adventures and stuff, and you see my pictures. One of the things that always amazes me, and it brings me back to, like, how things grow if they have a good root system Joanne, you'll probably appreciate this because you're up in the UP. Um, but if you're ever out and you're hiking, the thing that amazes me the most is when there's a rock cliff. Yep. For some reason, there is a dang tree growing out of that rock. <laughs> <laughs> and it reminds me all the time of how God's word is your root and no matter your circumstances then you can grow and it just it just always amazes me that tree and it's sometimes not even like a little tree like it's like a oh. big tree like this big and then you look at the rock and that crack is like that big <laughs> but where is the root system in there you know did that penetrate that far that it can do that. And then I think to myself, if that tree can withstand that, what can I withstand? What challenge can I overcome if my roots are really planted in the Bible and in God? Um, and so whenever those like doodads come up, it, it always brings me back to like those types of things. And just if you're walking and you're hiking, it's like I just, I see this Bible verse section like all the time. Um, and then I always relate it back to me. And I think if that can do that, how can I not? How can I not as I'm powered by the one? How can I let the devil convince me not to come to Bible study, you know, but Kathy, you overcame that little challenge and here. Yes. Um, Good for you. I didn't overcome it last week. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, you know, yeah, it happens, right? I mean, it's different. I'm kind of like, I don't have a choice, right? I mean, I'm stuck. <laughs> you know, um, but those are differences. If I, if I had free will and free choice, might I miss? Mm, that's a good chance. Um, <laughs> you know. Why? Because we're all human and we all, that all happens. It always happens. So um, then we continue. Again, this was like one of the nice things. And I think in the book of Luke, he also described and gave us the definition of the parable of the sower. Um, and I like those parables where they actually tell me what they mean. Because um, <laughs> then I don't have to try to think too hard. Um, but how about the lamb? What is Jesus telling us about light? You are the light of the world. What does that mean? You must be willing to receive the word so you can pass it on you can't just go through the motions okay yeah so if you get the light and you become the i mean you're what does light do illuminate yeah and then if you have a light what's the purpose of a light uh, to illuminate what more Every light no, everything. A room. A room. Uh, when, do you, when do you turn the light on? 
When it's that dark. Always when it's dark, right? Yeah. Is it telling me not, not to be a cro a closet Christian? Yeah. That's a, there's a good one, right? Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah. You know, you can I was worried about that about, on... about monks, you know, how, how they become in a move, move into a monastery, you know. Is that, is that really healthy? Be a healthy Christian? Yeah, what's the mm -hmm. purpose? I mean, yeah, what's no, the but, purpose uh, of this right here, right? I mean, if if we go like this and I turn the light on, right, you can see. Can you see the light? Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. So, like, really, it's, and, and where are, you know, this is us. You know, up there. If we shut that off, what do we do in a dark world? We stumble. Well, we do, but what about other people? They can stumble they too. Yeah, they can stumble. Yeah, they stumble in the dark, they can fall, but we're depriving them of the. You know, when you think about light, many times people equate light with knowledge because you can read. You can learn things in the light. Mm -hmm. So if we hide our light, we're depriving people of this very wonderful gift that we can share with them. If we're closet Christians, as, as Doug says. Yeah. So, yeah. The light does no good if we hide it behind a door. Right. You know, think of that, old, that, that song, This Little Light of Mine. Right. Don't worry, we ain't going to sing it. <laughs> Sorry, Kathy, but we're not singing this little light of mine. Okay. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. This little light of mine. It's gotten away from you, Tim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Many of my classes, many of these things do get away from me. So it's not <laughs> uncommon. This ain't the first time. Um, but yeah, and, and that's us. We're the light. I mean, I look at it I, real simple again for me. You turn the light on when it's dark. You turn the light on so you can see. You know, you turn the light on so you're not scared. Because me, I'm still scared of the dark. You know? Um, and that's the same thing. It's different. I mean, if you look outside, look behind Kathy right now, it's real light you know, because it's during the day, but it's still a very dark and scary world, you know, unless you have the light of Christ shining through you for other people to be able to see. And if you tune into the church service this Sunday, you're going to hear another thing um, about that light of Christ through us when it talks about um, they will know you're, you are Christians by your love love right same thing as the light they'll know you are a christian if you are shining god's light so then we continue with this the parable of the seed of growing is that the one that i got there verse yeah, the 25 um maybe it's no. oh, this is still under the lamp yeah right this one here help me out um, help me understand the second half of verse 25. Um, and that is the part where it says, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So if you read just that, it might not make a lot of sense. So let's read the whole thing. For, the, for to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. I saw that as if, um, if you have more acceptance of his word, you'll continue, continue to receive it. But if you are weak in it, the devil will get to you and take it all away. And you'll just hmm. revert. I like that. I like it. You need to have the whole heart, otherwise Satan wins. So if you have a little bit, Satan's going to even take that. Yeah, because you're too weak to. Because you're, you're, you're letting your spirit grow. 
So if you have your, if the spirit's in you, right? Help me out, make sure I'm on track. So the spirit's in you and you're living and you're giving, you'll just always get. Because he'll keep filling me up, right? Is that what you're saying? I think so. Okay, but if I don't, if I don't, if, if he's there, but I don't really do it, then ultimately the devil wins and that little bit of the spirit will be taken away. I don't know what I thought, yeah. Kind of what you were going? Yeah. But sometimes like when I do that, I like to be able to make sure I can put something into my own perspective so I know. Um, but that one there, and it's interesting because that was also in the book of Luke when we read that one. Um, that verse was in there. But that helped me. Thank you. Um, then there is the parable of the seed of growing. What part of growing God's kingdom do we have? Can I create, can, can I make anyone believe? No. Dang it. So if I'm supposed to grow his kingdom, what am I supposed to do? And people show them the way. Show them the way. Can I bring them with me? Like, what if I tie a rope on them <laughs> and I bring them with? Will they believe? Not necessarily. So Probably can I, not. Can I drag them to church and then they'll believe, right? Is that no. my job? No. <laughs> Your job is to plant the seed. Plant By, the seed. Yeah. Right. You know, if if you're a gardener, you know that when you plant you plant a seed, you provide it with uh, nourishment and a desirable environment to grow, but you can't guarantee that the seed will sprout. And sometimes you don't do very much for that little seed in the way of even providing. But you do enough, you put it in the ground so that it can take. Oh, Kathy, Kathy froze. Yeah, that reminds me, I need to water my lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting, right? Maybe for like, and you know, do we water the seeds that are planted? Yes, you nourish it. You know, I mean, we have, like, it's interesting because, like, that little section it did talk about, I think the only thing we really do is plant the seed, right? In the Bible, that's what it says. We just plant the seed, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then when it does that, and I think Kathy was alluding to that, um, oh, there she's gone. I think she has to get ready to go practice, so... Um, She's probably out of the closing prayer thing. Um, <laughs> I'm doing really bad. I'm picking people who don't show up or that leave early. Uh, but, oh, there she's back on. She's here for more. But, hi, Kath, you're back. Um, but it's interesting. Hey. If, out there. What's that? I was feeling pretty lonely out there. Well, you look pretty lonely. I'm um, like. But the way that I think Kathy was describing it is we plant it, and regardless of what we do, um, this it may or may not it, it may, may or may not germinate and produce a flower or a grain of wheat. We don't know. You know, it's up to God, and that's the blessing I give every plant that I put in the ground. I say I'm doing the best I can for you right now, but from this <laughs> point on, it's between you and God. <laughs> and I have a very lush garden, I will tell you. It's not not good nummy uh, veggies and stuff like lettuce, but it's beautiful flowers. And I go out there every day and thank God for that garden. Great. So how about the mustard seed? What's the connection then between the mustard seed? And then we'll probably have to close with our prayer because I think we got to go get ready to do our recording thing. But yeah, like the mustard I I was seed. get out of it. Yeah. The mustard seed is the smallest seed you can plant in the ground. So yeah. just a tiny bit of spreading the word can blossom 
into an amazing Christian plant. So that is like spot on, right? No matter what we do, no matter how insignificant, like you said, Kathy, no matter how much we do, that little tiny bit of that Christian seed that we planted in that person might be all God needed. But nevertheless, he needed you to do it. Right. You know, um, and then I look back and I think, man, how many times did my youth pastor think to himself, I am wasting my time. <laughs> Did he, you know, and, and he's the, and he's the planter who doesn't get to see, because I can't find him. I tried to track mm -hmm. him down, but I can't find him. Um, so no matter the smallest little thing that we do for someone, the, the smallest little ray of light that you are might be the one thing that God needs to have the Holy Spirit work in that person to bloom into that type of, of tree or that type of Christian. So unfortunately, we didn't make it to question six or seven. Um, but if you read that, you know, really, this is between you and God anyways, and we're just here to kind of chat and kill an hour during the day. Um, but I do not want Kathy to miss her opportunity for the closing prayer that she had, you know, <laughs> ready for. Um, so we'll close with prayer, and then we will, um, we're out. So please pray with Kathy. Okay. I had so much prepared, and now my mind has gone crazy. But Heavenly Father... You know, it is difficult for us sometimes to understand how we can influence and plant seeds in other people and lead them to your light and truth. We're thankful that we have this time together to explore your word and find those little nuggets that help us to reach out to others and to show. Um, the light of your life by the way we live ours according to your will. We pray that we will open our hearts and minds to your Holy Spirit and continue to grow as Christians so that we can share your love with the world. We ask this in the name of your dear beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, so stay tuned for next week to see if your name will pop up on the closing prayer.